So we at least officially reject racism and uphold the equality of all human beings. But while that's certainly a progressive step, we have to ask, why do we stop at the boundaries of our species? Why is it we think that all humans are equal in some fundamental way, but no non-human animals can even approximate to this community of equals, the being the sphere of beings whom we regard as equal in some fundamental moral sense. The animal liberation movement has challenged this speciesist morality and challenged us to give equal consideration to the interests of all beings who can feel pleasure or pain, irrespective of species. A third wave has come from our growing knowledge of non-human animals. And in particular here, let me go back to the great apes. Jane Goodall was the first human being to be so well accepted by a group of free living chimpanzees that she could spend hundreds of hours observing them in their natural habitat at close range. And Diane Fossey carried out similar studies of gorillas in Rwanda. The work of these two women, and one could also mention that of Baruta Galdikas in uh, in Borneo with orangutans. Uh, the, wor the work of these women has led to books read by millions and started a public fascination with our nearest relatives. Their observations have repeatedly broken down the barriers that we sought to erect between us and other animals. For example, we used to say before Goodall's observations that humans are the only animal to use tools, that we are special, that's a mark of our specialness, that we are a tool-using animal. And then Goodall saw that chimpanzees would poke thin sticks or straws of grass into the holes of termite nests so that the termites would grab them and then they would withdraw the sticks and eat the termites at the end of the stick, uh, obviously using it as a tool. Well, people said, but only humans make tools. The chimpanzees just find them. No, that turned out to be wrong too. Firstly, the chimpanzees would sometimes shape their sticks for probing into the termite nests. They would pull off the little branches and side leaves. And more recently, they've been observed to use even more complex tools. Chimpanzees in areas where uh, nuts grow in hard shells have been observed to carry around uh, two rocks to use as a hammer and an anvil to crack the nuts. And they'll even take that to a good tree or an area where there's lots of nuts. And more recently, it was just reported in uh, New Scientist, they've even been observed to use one stone to sharpen another. In other words, to make stone tools. So the barriers between us are falling. But there was one further barrier which lasted rather longer. Many regarded, have regarded language as the decisive barrier between us and them. And it's true that early attempts to, chi early attempts to teach chimpanzees to speak failed dismally. But they failed for the very simple reason that the chimpanzees lacked the vocal cords to make our kind of sounds. When two American scientists, Ellen and Beatrice Gardner, brought home an infant chimpanzee called Washo into their homes and treated her exactly as they would if she were a deaf human child. By using American Sign Language to communicate with her and with each other in their presence, using exactly this language that is being used here to convey my words to those uh, who are not able to hear me, they found that Washo acquired a large vocabulary of these signs. She learned to understand uh, and actually use a couple of hundred different signs and to use them in intelligent ways to achieve her purposes. Later, when she got older, she uh, was given a, um, an adopted child. She, uh, her, she had a baby, but her own baby died, and she was given another young chimpanzee to adopt as a baby. And she began to communicate with that chimpanzee in signs. In other words, she passed on the signs to another generation of chimpanzees. 
And she now lives with four other chimpanzees in Central Washington University in Ellensburg, Washington State, where the chimpanzees communicate with each other using sign language. And sometimes they've been uh, observed even to, um, to talk aloud when they're alone, um, when they think they're alone. They're being observed through a one-way mirror, uh, uh, showing that they've actually got a kind of a fantasy life if they speak to themselves. And uh, gorillas and orangutans have also learned to use this sign language to, uh, to quite a significant extent. They've learned to use language even to deceive uh, in some cases. In other words, we are not even the only species that can tell lies. Uh, Chantek, an orangutan, uh, was seen to steal an eraser, a pencil eraser, uh, put it in his mouth, and signed, food, eat. Um, but in fact, he didn't eat the eraser. He tucked it into his cheek, and later when he went to his room, he put it in the back corner of his uh, cupboard where he keeps things that he <laughs> likes to keep. Now, there have been, as one might expect, given the strength of the idea that there is some intrinsically terribly important difference between us and, and animals, there have been attempts to deny that uh, this is really language, that it's being intentionally used, and so on. But I think those attempts now have, have really finally run out of steam. There has just been so much data produced, so many different studies, um, using, uh, many of them using American Sign Language, some of them using uh, keyboard uh, icons linked into a computer so that every key pressed is, is recorded. Uh, and as I say, there are examples of chimpanzees signing to each other when there are no humans around, or signing to themselves, or telling lies. I think it becomes impossible to deny that these chimpanzees are quite intentionally using language to communicate. So that barrier too seems to have gone. And what may be the final blow to the idea of the distinctiveness of human beings has now come from a more detailed knowledge of genetics. For many years, until quite recent times, even uh, biologists and uh, those who studied our evolution assumed that humans, that while humans and other great apes have a common ancestor, they thought that we nevertheless evolved in a separate branch. In other words, you have this common ancestor here, and then you get the chimpanzees, uh, or the orangutans, gorillas and chimpanzees, off on this branch, and the humans all off on, the, on a separate branch. When we now have more detailed knowledge of the DNA of ourselves and these great apes, we find, to our surprise, that the difference in DNA between us and the chimpanzees is less than the difference between the chimpanzees and the gorillas we share 98.4% of our DNA with chimpanzees. In other words, we're separated only by 1.6%, whereas gorillas and chimpanzees are separated by 2.3%. So instead of this sort of basic fork between all the great apes and us, what we really have is a line of development which, from which first the orangutans branch off, secondly the gorillas branch off, and at this stage, we and our common ancestor with the chimpanzees are still together. And only after that do we and the chimpanzees separate. And on the basis of this discovery, some leading scientists, including Richard Dawkins, a lecturer in zoology at the University of Oxford, and Jared Diamond, professor of physiology at the University of California in Los Angeles, have proposed that we should change the way in which we classify ourselves and the other African apes. We should not be calling the chimpanzee pan troglodytes, but homo troglodytes, to show that we belong not to the same species, but to the same genus as the chimpanzee. And the gorilla should be homo gorilla, because it too is a close relative. <coughs> we are, as Jared Diamond puts it in the title of his book, the third chimpanzee. There are Two, species, two other species of chimpanzees, the common chimpanzee, Pan troglodytes, and the pygmy chimpanzee, or bonobo. We are the third chimpanzee. Well, what does this mean in ethical terms? What it means, I think, is that we can now argue very strongly on the basis of what we know about the great apes, 
that at the very least, we should extend that community of equals to which I referred before, the community of beings whom we recognize as all in some way having some fundamental equality, we could extend that to the other great apes. We should extend basic rights to them, rights to uh, have their lives protected, not to be uh, killed, for example, for um, the benefit of others, uh, as you know, they might be if their organs were taken for transplantation. Uh, to have the maximum amount of liberty consistent with their own welfare, not consistent with our interests, and to be protected from torture, which we regard as a basic human right, and uh, that should include the deliberate infliction of diseases and other forms of suffering. The central tenet of the Great Ape Project, which I launched with my Italian colleague, Paolo Cavalieri, is to, f to advance the cause for giving the Great Apes these basic rights. Let me just consider some possible objections that people may have to this project. Some will say that we ought not to concern ourselves with the rights of apes when so many human beings are still unable to enjoy the rights which, according to various United Nations declarations, they already hold. There's no denying that humans need better protection of their rights to life, liberty, and protection from torture. But why is this a reason for not doing anything about the great apes? It's rather like saying that we ought not to send any aid to Rwanda as long as there are homeless people here in the United States. Well, I certainly think we should be doing more to help homeless people in the United States or in any other country where there are homeless people. But that's not a reason for making the people of Rwanda or any other particular problem area uh, for making them starve to death when we can help them. We should be helping people or beings deprived of their basic rights wherever they are, wherever we can most help them, and not consider whether it's here or there or our species or a different species. It's the need that's relevant, not the geography or the biology. A second objection that some of you may have is that having read my book, Animal Liberation, as I hope at least a few of you will have, you might wonder why I'm now focusing on such a small group of animals. After all, in Animal Liberation, I talk about the plight of the tens of millions of laboratory animals, now estimated to be something like 17 to 22 million animals used in laboratories in this country alone each year, and the literally billions of farm animals killed each year in the United States. Billions because, uh, in particular, there are so many chickens who are slaughtered each year. Even without the chickens, it would be hundreds of millions. These animals certainly suffer in uh, all sorts of ways which I've described in Animal Liberation and in particular through close confinement and perhaps since I'm here speaking in Wisconsin, the state that produces more intensively raised veal than any other state, it's worth remembering those veal calves who are, as we speak, not far from here, confined in individual stalls so narrow that they can't turn around so short that they can't walk more than half a step to or fro, uh, never having a straw for a bedding because if they might eat it and that might turn their flesh a bit of a healthier pink colour rather than the pale colour for which some restaurants will still pay a higher price. This is a miserable, totally deprived, totally exploitative form of existence. And I've certainly not in any way lessened my opposition to or my concern to do something about factory farming of any species of animals or the suffering that occurs for laboratory animals irrespective of their species. But at the same time I see 
that we have been able to make only slow progress in achieving those goals. I think we are making some progress. And some countries at least have banned the veal crate that is so common in this state. In Britain, for example, that crate is illegal. It does not exist in my own country, in Australia either. But uh, progress has been slow in part because of the scope of the opposition. We are taking on huge multinational corporations. We are taking on the agribusiness industrial complex here. And they have enormous amounts of money that they are prepared to spend in defending their practice, their ways of farming. And for the population as well, it requires them to make changes. I was delighted to hear Professor Card say in her introduction that after reading Animal Liberation, she's changed her diet. And in fact, I think it's true that those who read those arguments and find themselves unable to refute them and I'm certainly not convinced that there is a basis for refuting them after all these years. I haven't come across something that has changed my fundamental way of thinking. Uh, I think that does require you to change your diet. But there are, of course, many people for whom that is just too big an obstacle. They're not going to read a book that might have that implication for them. Or if they are going to read it, um, they're going to push it aside and uh, say, oh, no, it's just too difficult. I know there are such people. The Great Ape Project, in a way, tries to take a different tactic, tries to take a different line of approach to this whole issue and says, look, yes, we should keep pushing on that front, but let's try to narrow the gap between humans and non-human animals. Let's try and bridge that gap a little bit so that uh, we don't think of animals as so different from us. And maybe that'll make it in the long run easier to change things not only for the great apes, although that's certainly worth doing in itself, but for all animals as well. So that's why Paolo Cavalieri and I produced the book to which Professor Card referred, The Great Ape Project, which is centered on a declaration of the rights of the great apes, something that uh, we are asking people to support. And the book consists of essays by 34 scientists, people like Jane Goodall and others who've worked with apes, uh, teaching them sign language and so on, and philosophers and uh, a lawyer and others, indicating why they support the Declaration of Rights for the Great Apes. <coughs> and what we hope to achieve eventually with that book is to get such broad support in many countries, and we do have supporters in many countries already, that we can go to the United Nations and say, look, you've got declarations of rights for humans, for um, various categories of humans, for children, for the intellectually disabled, and so on. How about extending rights beyond the human species to at least the great apes? I think the book makes a very powerful case for this. And it makes this case sometimes by philosophical argument, but sometimes by merely presenting some particular moments of contact that human beings have had with the great apes. For example, Geza Teleki is a scientist who studied under the guidance of Jane Goodall in Tanzania. And he describes in his essay in the book, how he would like in the evening, how he liked in the evening to climb a ridge behind the camp and watch the spectacle of the sun setting over Lake Tanganyika. And one evening as he was sitting on this grassy ridge overlooking the lake, he noticed that there were two chimpanzees climbing to the crest of the same ridge. But they were not together, they were climbing from, from opposite sides of the ridge, so they couldn't see each other until eventually they met at the top of the ridge. And he watched to see what would happen as they met. Imagine his feelings when the chimpanzees did meet at the top, stood upright, clasped their hands, made uh, greeting hoots, and then sat down together on the same side of the ridge as he was to watch the sunset. Never again, Teleki says, 
could he think of chimpanzees as so different from us? He'd recognize something of his same, the same spirit within them. And another revealing incident comes from the chimpanzee Washo, who, as I mentioned, was reared from infancy by Alan and Beatrice Gardner, who taught her to use sign language. When she was five years old, they sent her away with one of the people who'd been caring for her, Roger Fats, and uh, his wife, Deborah Fats, to an institution in Oklahoma. In fact, from there, they then went, as I said, to Ellensburg. It was 11 years before either of the gardeners saw Washoe again. After that time, they came to visit. Without any warning, they simply walked into the room where she was. Washoe immediately signed their names, and then she signed, come Mrs. Gardner, and led her to an adjoining room, and there she began to play a game which she had played with the gardeners before she was five years old, but had never been seen to play since. Well, let me conclude by asking you the question, where does this lead? Where should we go to from here? I believe that um, what we have is a situation in which the non-human great apes are essentially slaves in our society. They are thinking intelligent beings, as I hope I've demonstrated to you, but they are enslaved to work largely in laboratories, uh, also for human entertainment, sometimes in, in zoos and in uh, some other areas of entertainment. And they have no legal rights. They are at law simply a thing, simply an object of property, just as much as any kind of statue, for example, uh, is an object of property, and just as much as slaves were objects of property before they were freed. In 1991, the United States government set official minimum standards for the caging of these slaves laboratory chimpanzees in particular. The re recommended cage size for permanently confining a single adult chimpanzee was five feet by five feet by seven feet. I think it's time to put the slavery of the great apes behind us. At present, we imagine a vast gulf between humans and other animals. The gulf has disastrous consequences, not only for the apes, but for all species, all, spe all species of non-human animals. I invite you, therefore, to see the Great Ape Project, not as championing, championing the cause of one relatively small group of animals, but rather as building a bridge between us and the other species, a bridge that will eventually lead to a different attitude to all sentient creatures. Thank you very much for your attention.